Hi guys, welcome to Wisdom and Torah Ministries. This is Witcast, W-I-T podcast. We get together sometimes, we have different topics, and we want to have a, um, a time and a section in which we don't have to be so only driven by Bible topics, And but today we're going to do a Bible topic, as we as we always do. I want to be able to have the freedom through Witcast to do different things off the box, out of the box. But I was talking to my buddy, Joe Halevi, who's in the screen right now, and you know, I wanted to, to I, I was asking, I was calling him to validate information, to verify some things in the Hebrew, and because he's my, he was my Hebrew teacher. He's pretty good, by the way. And um, and we began to start talking about the New Testament, the first century writings, and the validity of the temple and the services after the resurrection of Yeshua. The reason is I'm surrounded by books right here because I'm getting my PowerPoint ready for the temple course. 2022 uh, Treasures of the Temple in Orlando, Florida. So what I'm doing, I'm taking verses from the New Testament in which it speaks about a particular event. It quotes certain things, but then people don't realize the amounts of things that were going on in the temple when those verses were quoted. So that's uh, that's going to be my line uh, of teaching in the temple course. Then we started talking, Joel and I. And we began to realize that many people in the New Testament do not realize the validity and the language and how Jewish the New Testament is. I remember about 11, 12 years ago, I asked you, Joe, welcome, Joe, to the program. It's always nice to have you. By the way, last time you did uh, the uh, program with me on the, the Qumran and all those calendars and stuff, people really liked it. You know, so we have to do another one again. Yeah, well, we'll we'll do. I have a whole bunch of ideas in my head. We'll do a few things. Okay, sounds good. Uh, but you know, I'm always right, and you're always wrong. Just let's get, let's get that. Out yes, of that's it. that's the absolute truth. Yes. You know, I've been telling you that for the last 17 years, right? And you never believed me, so I'm going to continue to try. All right. So the question is this, Joe. We've known, and you've known that the the, the transition you and I have been through in the last 17 years. For the people who are watching for the first time, Joe and I have been friends for. 17 years. His son, his oldest, was one month old when I met him. That's why he remembers me. <laughs> all right. So one of the things that we've been discussing all along. Now, by the way, full disclosure, uh, Joel Halevi is not a believer in Yeshua like you and I are. But we've been discussing New Testament for a long time. And he's really open about a really good debate and open conversation about the New Testament and all the things that are going on in the New Testament. So there's no hidden agenda here. He respects me. I respect him. And we go from there. We're, best, we're really good friends. And he's my brother. Uh, now, but one of the things that you've come to the realization after all these years, hanging out with people on the tour, um, having heated debate between you and I about certain topics, is that I remember the time in Jerusalem we were talking. And you said, I'm afraid that the Judaism today is not the same one in the first century. We were in Jerusalem walking in, the, in Jerusalem, and I say, well, that's what I've been trying to tell you, that the New Testament is a Jewish book. And I said, why don't you consider the New Testament as a historical account? Because you will not look at it in any other way. For your credit, though, I want to tell the audience, for his credit, he did. He went back, and he started looking at the New Testament. And what did you find in your reading? Oh, it's a bit more complicated than that, because I end up going to university and, and doing a bachelor's in history and a master's in biblical studies and uh but the, the process was a really interesting one um one of the things that's first of all we have to really kind of trace back some of the elements here so you have to understand that within judaism the new testament is perceived as a christian book it right. is not perceived as something that was written by jews it's the evangelion uh, you know actually there's a whole a lot of jokes that were made about different names there were some very harsh literature written throughout the years. I mean, there was a there's a, a written debate that existed within Judaism where uh, people were debating Christianity and Christians were debating in the same manner and writing things about one another. And when you're raised Jewish, when you're raised in an Orthodox family, the, the exposure to the New Testament is usually third party. You don't really know any of anything that's written within it. Now, because uh, I come from, um, I would say, a slightly more open-minded family. We, we never had a problem with discussing New Testament, and we never really had a problem, for example, I watched 
uh, the, the very famous uh, 1970s miniseries, Jesus of Nazareth. So that was one of the ways I was exposed to the New Testament. Right. But we also had, you know, there was the, we, we would receive broadcasts from Lebanon and Jordan. There's Christian communities there. So there's this, there was this television show called Flying House. I don't know if anyone remembers that one. Um, so there was some exposure to the New Testament. So we, I knew who, uh, we called him Yeshu, which is just a Galilean pronunciation of the word Yeshua. Um, and in English, we called him Jesus. So there was some exposure. Mm -hmm. But when you first met me, I was in a process of becoming more extreme about things. I remember. And, and really, it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing how you showed up and kind of counterbalanced that. Yeah. And it was not happened, easy. It was not easy, though. It was not easy. I was I was very stubborn. I have to remember, I was in my early 20s. I'm almost 40 now. So, you know, you I was rude. You were mean to me. Look at this face. Oh, uh, enough. You, you have to stop whining about that. <laughs> <laughs> you made it difficult at times because, again, you had a perception uh, about something that and then I, I come around and it's like a different, complete different twist. And you could not wrap your head around that for a little bit. It took you a little bit to, to try to figure it out. Yeah, but the, the thing is that we, we both come from places where we're taught things about the other side, and we never actually step into the other side and, and start reading it. Very true. So, so I remember you, you uh, were having discussions, and the more I was hearing about things, and the more people I kept on meeting through your tours, through people who came to my workplace, um, I, I got to meet a lot of very interesting people throughout the years. I think it's in the number in the thousands by this point. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting to see that people were actually seeing a much more Jewish side to the New Testament. And this was something that really intrigued me. Now, I always suspected that the Judaism we practice today is not the same as in the past. And back then, I was only really starting to really read um more academic literature I mean, one of the main things i spent doing in that museum when no one, when no one was there was actually read a lot of material and uh what i discovered was first of my notion was correct and a lot of academics have pointed this out but when i started looking into the new testament and i remember i, I at one point i asked you can you do me a favor and get me a copy of the new testament i know i got I remember um, when I, I was really and, surprised when you said that i when i got it for you and you start reading it, you were telling me some interesting things that happened. Yeah, I, and then I made the mistake of reading Revelation that early on. It, it went weird very quickly. And yeah. and I, I have to openly admit, I don't know the New Testament as well as you do. Mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, I can say I don't really know the New Testament. Um, but I've had throughout the years many, many interesting discussions with you and other people and have come to the realization that we do need to read the New Testament as, or at least the Synoptic Gospels as a Jewish document. I mean, even the writings of Paul are very Jewish, and even the book of Revelation, as, as difficult as the book is, it is still part of the apocalyptic literature that we have in the Second Temple era. Let, let's and, talk a little bit about, let's go on that line right now. Let me, let me guide you through a line, because I, wanna, I want the audience to really understand where we're trying to come from. All right, I remember about 11, 12 years ago, I asked you, Joel, I need your help. You know, I've been doing research on the book of Hebrews for a long time. And I remember I asked you, hey, man, I called you about the golden incense. And when I when you read it from the uh, the New Testament in Hebrew, you say, well, yeah, that's the golden censer. Uh, and then the Bible says the golden altar of incense in some translations. So there you help me. And then you said something that I never forgot. You said because you read the whole book of Revelation, uh, Hebrews. To help me with the whole research, he says, well, and this is what I remember you saying. You said, well, the first two chapters, uh, you know, because you don't believe in the pre-existent Messiah like I do. But you said, but whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was a, he understood scripture. He understood Midrashim. He understood how to, how to, how to use uh, certain things that normally Christians have no idea about. And I think that's the problem with the lack of understanding of the book of Hebrews that is a Jewish book written by a Jewish person in a Jewish context using the tabernacle and the temple, yet we don't study those things, either the Hebrew, the language, the culture, or the temple, thus we have such a big mess. Never forgot that. What was your findings? What were your findings when you read the book of Hebrews for me that one time? What was it that stuck out the most to you, stood out the most? We are talking about something from about eight years ago, so I don't remember everything. 
But I, I will first of all frame one thing. There is a problem within uh, religious circles. I'm going to use the word religious in a very free way. But there is a problem in religious circles, both Jewish and Christian, that uh, people read scripture but don't have the actual tools to understand this ancient literature. And this is, this is a problem. So, for example, I'm, I'm what's known as a textualist. Um, textualists are basically people that our work is to understand text um, and not understand the material text is written on, even though I did work on Dead Sea Scrolls and we, I, I studied that stuff as well. But one of the problems that we have is people attempting to reconstruct religion. In other words, you read the text, you don't know the context as you described, and then you end up inventing a new form that's not the original intent. It, and we have to openly say, sometimes maybe there was not one original intent, maybe several intentions within a description. And I remember as I was reading this, it looked as if, first of all, the writer uh, knew of the idea of the heavenly temple. This is a, a well-known thing that developed in the Second Temple era and gets a very heavy development within rabbinic midrash to a point why by the 10th century, we even hear about this concept of a temple that was sent from heaven. I think that was one of the first things I noticed. Also, the idea of an angelic being, doesn't, doesn't matter right now how we define that, but an angelic being that does temple service in this heavenly temple. And it seemed to me that the way Yeshua is being described there follows that pattern. The writer, and this was this was the big, I think, the clencher that we remember. You, uh, we were sitting in Jerusalem a couple of years ago when you asked me. You actually, it was kind of cool. You sat me in a way everyone could see me, and you said, "You turn around to say, Joel, what do you understand?" And he says, "It's a midrash." So one of the main things that came up, and I think this is the biggest one, is the realization that he's not saying that Yeshua is literally a kohen. Mm -hmm. He's actually saying that Yeshua has a function that resembles a Kohen the same way other things can function as a Kohen, but are not necessarily a Kohen. And exactly. therefore, for example, the claim that people make that they can go anywhere in the Temple Mount because Yeshua went there, no, that's not what he's saying. Right. He's actually saying something completely different. He's trying to create a Midrash about the idea of what does Yeshua represent within Second Temple Judaism in reference to the Kohen Gadol. The, in reference that he's, he's basically trying to explain the concept of atonement through temple service. Right. Uh, explain to the audience who don't know the terms what Midrash so, is according to Jewish standards. Well, Midrash is a complicated thing because there's different types of Midrashim, but Midrash is basically taking a text from the Bible and either uh, imposing on it some kind of an historical event or giving it an interpretation that's outside of the simple meaning. So, for example, you can have Midrashim that deal with um, the Nephilim, which I'm actually going to be releasing a, uh, a, um, a, a podcast on this very soon on my website. And the Nephilim are described in one verse in, in the entire book of, of Bereshit, in, in Genesis. And the problem is that from there, we have this thing called Nephilim, we have all these legends about giants. So someone took giants and angels and kind of mishmashed them together. And we end up with the Book of Watchers um, in the Inukian literature. And so that's a type of very, very old Midrash, maybe one of the earliest Midrashim that we have. There's lots of different types. Of, even in the Tanakh itself, there are Midrashim, but they are um, of a much more subtle nature. And these things develop more and more until we reach a point where Midrashim really go into these full-blown stories where, for example, it says in Isaiah um, that he will shave the, um, he will shave the, uh, the heads uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a shaving uh, blade and the hairs of the legs and so on. That developed into one of the most bizarre Midrashim ever, which literally says that God appeared in the form of a man and shave the head of the of the king of Assyria, <laughs> and besides the fact well, that that was it, an, that became an interpretation based on something they didn't understand. It's an well, it's more of an imagery. The problem is this imagery gives the notion that God has a form. How can you even say that? Well, that's the problem. What, what you know, is the intention here is to say God really has a form, or is the intention to say this is a symbolic idea? It's it's it, this has always been the problem with midrashim. So, the, 
So, Midrash is not always perfect, and this is right. why some Midrashim are better, some are less, uh, are less so, good. This is the reason why I stopped reading a lot of Midrash. I used to study it all the time, and people put a lot of effort and energy reading the Midrash, and they believe everything in the Midrash as if it is true, and they don't realize that many times they're just an interpretation or like you were describing it. Uh, let me move on, let me, let's move on to the next question. Um, you consider the New Testament, as we call it, or the first century writings, Synoptic, synoptic, synoptic Gospels as Jewish documents written by Jewish people in a Jewish culture in a Jewish language. Absolutely. Now, so, and, and, and I have to say something about this even more. As an historian, we use the New Testament as a reference point sometimes to historical events or understanding the Judaisms, it's plural, Judaisms of the Second Temple era. Absolutely. And, and, and I've actually quoted the New Testament in classrooms uh, when we were doing, for example, classes on, on, the, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And one time we actually read something in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which actually appears in the New Testament. And I quoted the New Testament and I'm the guy with the beard and the yarmulke and the tzitzit mm -hmm. sitting, on, sitting in the classroom. And every all the secular people turned around looking at me completely shocked. What is this Orthodox Jew quoting the New Testament? Right. What is this? Right. Well, they, this, said, is the one, this is the one thing that I was conveying to you in Jerusalem that one time, that if you don't, if, if, if modern Judaism will look at the New Testament as a Jewish document, understanding not what they've been taught or what they hear or see uh, through the uh, theology of Christianity, but through the context of what it says, we will have a complete different opinion of what the events happened in the first century. Um, well, but we need to, uh, sorry, I'm, cu I'm cutting off, but we also need to understand that the, everyone reads the New Testament within the prism of Judaism of their time. So if someone was talking about rabbinic Judaism, say in the 1500s, it won't it's be different. exactly the same understanding as a Judaism of the fifth century. And even <laughs> today, the discussions are slightly different. That's and and you, you take, for example, Isaac Trocki, who was a Karaite who wrote against Christianity, and his form of argumentation is completely useless these days because our understanding of how to understand written literature from that period is completely changed. Yeah, but remember that many people uh, were not educating ourselves to understand the different genre in the Bible, uh, time frames. Okay, for example, let me give you an example. Uh, I tell people when I go minister places, we read the book of Genesis, but we never study ancient Near Eastern Mesopotamian history or Ugaritic or Hittite. We read the book of Exodus. We never study uh, Egyptology. We read the book of Daniel. and We never consider uh, Babylonian captivity and the Babylonian culture. We the read the book of Esther. We never read Persian kingdom and their influence. We read uh, the Maccabees or we read the first century and we never study the Greco-Roman influence, the Greeks, and then the Greco-Roman history. No wonder we have a mess. So it's the same thing as in Judaism. We have the first century. We have the Sadducees. The Pharisees, and then you have two schools within the Pharisaic movement. Then you have the Naz, uh, the Nazarene. Then you have the um, then you have the Herodians, a political group. Then you have the Zealots. Then you have the other one I forgot, Sicarii. You got all these different groups oh, yeah. that people don't even think or don't even know existed. Now, and, all, and, they don't, they, and they didn't necessarily mesh with one another, right? Even though, even though. The Nazarite movement, the Sikari, well, Sikari, I'm not too sure about that because the Pharisees hated the Sikari, but the Sikari, the, the, the people from, from Gush Khalev, the people who followed Menachem, uh, Menachem and so on, these are all people who still fell in the category of Pharisaic Judaism. Right, but they don't know that, though. So they have an argument. Well, they don't, they don't know it, but, but they don't know it for, for several reasons. We actually have to, I think, account for the reasons why this happens. But first of all, finish your thought. But the thing is that there are times when I'm looking at this stuff and I'm listening to their arguments and I'm going like, I don't even say anything anymore because it's like I'm listening to them and I'm going like, man, but they're talking about different groups and they don't know the whole environment and the narrative in the New Testament. It's not like John Walton says, the Bible is written for us, but not to us. So when you read something in the New Testament and you never consider the geography, the topography, the history or who the audience is, what the problem is and what's going on and where they're at. It's only until I got to Israel, when I go to Israel and I see the topography, the geography, and then I'm understanding the history that I get a greater understanding of the problem that was going on in the first century. Now, you know, as well as I do, that 99% of all Messianics and Hebrew roots people are completely oblivious of the Mishnah and the legal rulings, which, by the way, if we learn the Mishnah, at least 50% of it, 
we will understand what Yeshua is dealing with in the first century in the Gospels. You know, well, I, I, I can make life a little bit easier. Um, David Flusser wrote a book called Jesus, and he tries to frame the the world of, of Yeshua within Second Temple Judaism. So that's very something you can read, very, very easy, book, very quick read, and he gives yeah. you a lot of interesting data. Very good book, by the way. And, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's difficult because as we're trying to understand, as we're trying to understand the context of the Bible, we want to not favor one or the other. We want to just understand truth. And one of the things that happens, many people overreact because they assume that we are trying to hit one or the other. And we're not trying to attack anybody. We are searching for context. We're searching for truth. You know, Elat Mazar, who was a leading authority in rabbinical, and I'm sorry, not rabbinical, archaeological world, she passed away in March. She told me yeah. something I never forgot. She said to me, Rico, evidence establishes truth. So I needed to remove myself from identifying myself as either Christian, Hebrew roots, Messianic. When I'm doing research, I have to be honest with what is in the text. The evidence in context establishes truth because I don't want to continue to make the New Testament as a midrash, given my own understanding and everything that I read. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot have a revelation or spiritual application to what you're reading. What I'm saying is that we cannot solely depend on that in everything we read. We have to sometimes go to the root of the context. So with that being said, do you, do you see when you read the New Testament, when you read it, that after the resurrection of Yeshua, the believers in Yeshua, they were all keeping the Torah. They were all going to the temple and they were all doing Jewish uh, things as a Jewish lifestyle. Um, yes, I think it's very, very clear that the framing of the actual life of these people, not the some of the messages that we get from different places or some of the interpretations that we hear, I think that when we think about Judaism during the Second Temple era and specifically the disciples, Yeshua himself, these were people who lived some kind of a semi um, Pharisaic type of lifestyle. Uh -huh. To what extent it's 100% clear to me. Uh, because we have no actual understanding of this, because one of the problems that we have is Yeshua sometimes has these arguments with the Pharisees. The Pharisees seems to be seem to be bothering him um, with different questions, but it's very clear that his education is Pharisaic. He knows Pharisaic law. He's well versed with Pharisaic law. He understands how to argue with Pharisaic Judaism, but therefore it means that he probably got a Pharisaic. Uh, um, um, he got a Pharisaic education, or at least as Josephus describes it, that the Pharisees were most comfortable with everyone, and therefore most people followed them. But what I find really interesting about the whole thing is that when I was reading the different variations of the story where Yeshua was being persecuted, it seems to be the, the Sadducees are probably the biggest instigators in the entire story, but different variations of the text um, try to insert the Pharisees in one way or another. The Pharisees, the scribes, it, it depends which one you read, but at the end of the day, there's this attempt to force the Pharisees into the story, even though it really is the Sadducees, and the Sadducees set everything up for the crucifixion. So what happens is you get this distorted understanding of who, what the Pharisees really were in that world, are the Pharisees really the bad guys? And then 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian arguments with Christianity or Rome hating Judaism, developing anti-Semitism, and framing things incorrectly to the point when you tell an average Christian, you do realize that Jesus was a Jew from Nazareth and he kept Torah, people's jobs uh, dropped yeah. to the full completely. Yeah. Uh, but when we think about their lives, they seem to be very, very Pharisaic. And more than that, to me, it seems to be that Yeshua's treatment of his own disciples was based on the concept of the Chavura, which was basically a rabbi and his students. They go around everywhere together. They eat together. They sleep yeah. in the same places together. He is living his life as a, as a quite common practice of Pharisaic rabbis of the era. Right. That is, that is actually, when I found that out, it's like everything changed. I began to look at the whole New Testament from a different perspective believing everything in it clearly but more from a contextual historical perspective and it made a lot more sense which it gave me a little bit more balance and more um, uh, foundation 
uh, not to be so rushed to try to judge. For example, let me review something you just said that I think is important. Uh, Caiaphas, as well as Ananias, they were not Pharisees. They were Sadducees. Sadducees. Yeah. And many people don't know the differences. And that's because if you do not read the, the Maccabees, um, you're not going to see the whole issue, that internal family struggle between the priestly family after the Maccabean conquest uh, and all the things that happened between that and the time Yeshua was crucified. And, um, and one of the things is that everyone assumes, like you said, that uh, Caiaphas was a Pharisee when he was not. He was a Sadducee. So just that alone, it helps us understand context. Now, if that's true and you did not know, then how many other things in the New Testament that you read and you assume it belongs to only one party? Like, for example, I've been reading different types of books in regards to first century uh, context, and they all say the same thing. The Pharisaic movement was relatively a small group. There's no more than 6,000 of them for according to some estimations. Everyone assumes that when you read the New Testament, that everyone was a Pharisee, and that's not the case. Uh, uh -huh. But the corruption, and I, I need to mention this, because the corruption within the high priestly family, God ordained, he, um, he ordained, he sanctified, and he uh, gave the authority to the sons of Aaron to become high priest. That family will forever have the office. Sadly, the people holding the office, the sons of Aaron, they got corrupted. People don't know the difference between the corruption between a person in an office that's holy. And that's the problem. They want to eliminate the office when, when in fact, it was the person running the office that was corrupted. And it's like in America right now, you can say, well, we have a president who in our opinion is corrupted. That does not mean the constitution is corrupted. It doesn't mean that the office of the presidency is, is bad. It's just the guy running it is terrible. So when I understood that from first century understanding, then when I read the book of Hebrews, then I understand that the writer is not trying to usurp the authority of the sons of Aaron if the temple standing. Then I have to ask my question. When was the letter to the Hebrews written? Around the year, you know, 64 to 70, around the time of the destruction of the temple, approximately, depending on who you're talking to. And, and then you understand the contrast. Without a temple, who's going to officiate on our behalf? Who's going to maintain the connection between heaven and earth? Then ancient Near Eastern context come into play. Now understand, Joel, that you and I are weird. We like to study this stuff. The normal audience maybe don't have the time. They got families. They got a job. They have all the things that are more pressing. Our job is to present it in a way that they can be edified. So the whole premise of our teaching, of our meeting today was trying to convey to the audience that there are texts. Let me give you an example. Okay. This is, and then we can talk from here. When we go to Acts chapter three, okay. When we go to Acts chapter three. And I mention it to you, and I can let you run for an hour, and you have enough stuff to say for an hour, just by me merely saying it to you. Watch this. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, you get a lot of information. If you're thinking the Jewish mindset, it tells you they're going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So as a Jewish person yourself, when you read that verse, what comes to mind? Well, first of all, the temple was up and not down. That's number one. Yeah. Uh, but that's a different discussion that you and I can have some other day about the location of the temple. But when you read something like that, the, autumn, the first thing goes to your mind is, oh, mincha. The mincha, which is the afternoon prayer. service. Pardon? The afternoon service. The afternoon service, exactly, which is practiced to this very day. Now, it is a very interesting thing that the New Testament is describing something which is not biblical law, but they're practicing this, and this was a common practice to pray during um, at least two points in time during the day, unless we go with Daniel, who says that he prayed three times a day, and um, they're basically going up at the ninth hour, which is around the time of Minchaktana. It's one of the points in time that you can pray the midday prayer. It starts at Minchagdola, which is somewhere just half an hour. Well, we have to frame this a little bit. 
there were types of, there were, they used to have a time division of the day into 12 units, which is something which was adopted from the Egyptians, but it's not 12 hours like we have today. Mm -hmm. These are what's called temporary hours or shaudzmaniyot, which means you take the time from sunrise or dawn all the way to sunset, and you divide up into 12, 12 parts, 12 equal parts. So you can have during summer, an hour can be an hour and a bit, an hour and eight minutes, an hour and 10 minutes, an hour uh, time uh, uh, calculation, hour time reckoning. And then sometimes you can have hours which are only 52 minutes long, 50 minutes long, because the days become shorter. And he's using this this concept here of ninth hour, meaning Sha'od's Maniyoti, the uh, adjustable hours. And they're literally going to pray at the temple at the same time that rabbinic Jews will pray even to this very day. That's so this true. is this is absolutely not only Pharisaic, completely rabbinic as well. Well, and, and that's really interesting because uh, rabbinical Judaism today comes from the Pharisaic movement. Yeah, the rabbinic Judaism is basically a descendant of um, of uh, of uh, Pharisaic uh, Judaism, and this is why rabbinical Judaism has elements in it we can find in the Dead Sea Scrolls because Pharisaic Judaism wasn't one thing. There were diff probably different variations of it. Right. And Pharisaic Judaism also perceived itself as a more global type of Judaism. It's a Judaism that accepts everyone. Right. And therefore, you would have elements that we would think were, were completely sectarian, say stuff you find in Dead Sea Scrolls or in Nukian literature and so on. It actually was considered to be partially mainstream within Judaism. And the moment uh, the Judaisms of the time, the Pharisaic Judaism, and then when the temple was destroyed and all these different groups pretty much dispersed, Sadducees no, no longer had a center. The Essenes actually went to war against the Romans and many of them were slaughtered. And Judaism was standing there saying, okay, let's absorb everything into ourselves. And this is why when you open up Midrashim, you find stuff that even though is not considered to be canon within Jewish, uh, the Jewish Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, you find them in the Midrashim themselves. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, for example, the, the fallen angels, which is Inukian literature, which was not accepted into the Tanakh, still appears within Midrashic literature. Gotcha. Which, by the way, the New Testament, some of the latter uh, parts, they do mention some of that. So people not understanding the first century uh, method of study or Midrashim, they're not really understanding the message behind it. So when you read in Acts chapter 3, uh, they're going for the temple. But what people don't realize in Acts 3 verse 1 when it says going up at the hour of prayer, when you read Luke chapter 1, verse 10, it tells you that when Luke, when Zachariah was doing the incense in the temple, they were praying inside and outside. So they were doing the Shmonez Ramida, the 18 benedictions that are outside, that comes all the way from first temple period. I mean, it's been all prayers. So what I'm trying to convey here is that neither defending one denomination or religion or the other, we're looking for the evidence, for the context. And we got to let the evidence establish any truth. It, it, it's, this happened after the resurrection of Yeshua. So clearly, you know, we can see that the temple function was continuing, that the disciples were respecting the rules and the statutes, the decrees that God established in regards to his holy things. So when they're praying at the hour of prayer, they were also doing sacrifices in the temple at the same time. And I've talked to people about it. And they never made the connection because they're just not aware of the temple protocol. But you, because you read the Siddur, you know that when you go through the Siddur, everything's structured as if it was temple service when you read it. Yeah, well, uh, I can't remember his um, Haman, um, Haman, I think his name was. Um, I, ha I have his book somewhere up here. Um, he, he, he tries to kind of do something like that. He wrote the book back in the, in the 80s. And he tried to kind of frame the, the Judaism of the time and try to find some kind of roots of rabbinic Judaism within Judaism of the Second Temple era. And you can argue if this is all true, but we do have some rabbinic traditions, like, for example, in the Tractate of Tamid, where it describes um, uh, prayer practices that the priests would do uh, before they actually did the Tamid, or during when they did Tamid, which some of them actually are are part of the liturgy we use today, like right. the. I got uh, the names. Let me mention some of the names, because I so have. So we either. have reciting the Shema, 
Right. We have reciting the Ten Commandments, which eventually was dropped from Jewish liturgy uh, because of some issues with people claiming that only that's the word of God. Uh, we have... Ahava uh, Olam. Ahava Olam. Olam, which is basically a prayer to say, which you can also say, instead of saying Birkot Torah, you have... Emet um, uh, Vayatim. or it depends on the variant of the text you want to use. Uh, we actually have um, a sidul from the second century that was discovered in Cairo, and it gives us a bit more insight into what their sidul looked like. They have a emet vayatziv, and they have seen emet vayatziv. Now the, these are the avat olam or ahava rabba depends on the version you have, and emet vayatziv are prayers that we say um, uh, before the Shema. So, so wait is, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me? And I know this, but just to create more excitement here to the group. You mean to tell me that in the temple, and I would like to share it, but I'm not going to right now because I have it right here. I'm reading it right now as part of my teaching, that they used to go to the uh, the chamber of hewn stone where the Sanhedrin used to meet Ishkata in the morning, and, and they used to do, the, that's right, Ishka Hagasit, and they used to do these prayers that are preserved in the Siddur today that you can find its history in this book. This book is called the Encyclopedia of Jewish Prayer. Every prayer in the Siddur, you can find here. It tells you where it comes from, how it was used, and who composed it, if they know. And it's really interesting because when I read this, it was a recommendation by my teacher, Joseph Good. When I read it and I'd be going through the Siddur, I learned a lot. And I found that 90% of all the prayers come from Temple Protocol. Boy, what a shocker. And, uh, I, I, I do, but I do have to put one a bit of a damper on this one. We have to be a, we have to be careful with. You always with, do that, man. Because what do you want? This is how I'm educated to to do you things. Always do that, man. We, we always have to be careful with things. So I I had a discussion with a a colleague of mine uh -huh. who uh, right now is in Belgium, if I'm not mistaken, and we discussed how much of the Mishnah really describes things that were in the temple and his understanding because his expertise is uh, is uh second temple literature or being literature he said to be some he, said, he told me to be careful with it he said well, some it things you can't you what it all depends who you talk to i've talked to of course no no he wasn't he wasn't about being anti he just said always be careful from well, his well, experience as a, as a doctor what, as a doctor what, of, of this type of literature pun isn't that what every Jewish guy tells you when you talk about anything biblical? Ah, no, it's problematic. But, but, but Be careful. <laughs> yeah, but Dr. Efrati is, 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 is actually a very good researcher, right? Every time I have questions about, because um, uh, we used to work together. This is why he's a colleague of mine. Uh -huh. um, we, we shared an office for a while. But uh, I, I just asked him, because it's my field is not rabbinic literature. My field is Bronze Age, Iron Age, Land of Israel, Mesopotamia, Great, uh, you know, Levant literature and so on. But because I, I come from a, a religious background, I did spend 15 years in yeshiva. I read a lot of rabbinic literature and commentary and so on. Uh -huh. But at the end of the day, I, I, I had to question it. You know, you, you, there's this always this urge inside you to question everything. And it just, it came up and I asked him and he said, yeah, be a little careful with it. But it doesn't mean that this was not done. You just have to be a little careful with it. But uh, Hein Heinemann? Heinemann, yes, his name was Heinemann. He wrote a book and there might be an English version of it. Heinemann basically wrote about prayer in uh, Second Temple Judaism, and he tries to claim, um, and he does an interesting job with it, he tries to claim that uh, you can accept that these descriptions are accurate. You can accept them? You can. Positive. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's like anything. You know, it's like when you do archaeological research. If you read the guys from Tel Aviv University, they think that nothing is real in the Bible. And then you read from somebody else, from uh, Elam Masar and some other stuff, and they help you validate the Bible. So it's like, you know, it all depends the motivation. But what I like to do... I, I have to refrain from commenting on that. Gotcha. But you know... <laughs> um, no, the Tel Aviv University... Did you study at Tel Aviv University does an amazing job. Um, the head of the biblical studies department there is a former professor of mine. Um, they, they, they're, they're an amazing university, but like anything in academia, you can argue. I, I come from Haifa University, which was snubbed by everyone. Right. You know? But at the end of the day, my teachers, my professors, if it's Professor Bendov or Professor Kahan or Professor Kislev, 
um, that's actually their titles, actually professors. Um, they always told me, try to keep a balanced mind about everything, question things, but always be careful how you question because sometimes you can become very, very one-sided and you can say things which are just completely ridiculous and but coat them in such academic um, jargon and glory that it'll be 100% convincing. Hey man, tell me about it. I deal with that all the time amongst the circles I'm with. There are people that speak certain things that when you hear them, and um, it's not because I know more than them. It's just that I'm looking into different areas. You know the change in my life in the last 17 years. You oh, met well, me. Yeah. yeah, right? I mean, the last 12 years have been completely different. And um, because I've decided to go back to school, educate myself, learn. Uh, and, and you had a lot to do with it, too, because when I met you in 2004, what people don't know is when I went to Israel the first time, I went with an attitude as thinking as I knew anything. It didn't take very long for me to realize that I don't know Jack. I got to sit down and learn again. And you were actually one of those guys that although you were really straightforward and you had no nonsense towards me, I always knew the value of listening and to go back and validate information. And, you know, it was a good influence because you challenged me to look at what I believe and say, can you validate it? And ever since I met you, my faith in Messiah has become stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's interesting because when I come up with a new uh, theme that I'm teaching, I always called you and tell you, hey, Joe, let me share with you what I'm studying. And it was actually you who got me in this journey of ancient Near East when I remember I was doing the Torah portions, the commandments in the Torah portion, I began to study them. And there was, uh, there's a Torah, there's a book that I have that has each commandment on each Torah portion. So I was only focusing on the commandments in each Torah portion. And the one about the priest wearing the long garments going to the altar. And I said, Joel, I got a question. There surely has to be a context for this. And y'all remember, man, you went like this. It was the funniest thing. Uh, it kind of made me mad because you went like this. You got the book. You opened the letter. Oh, yeah, because in Egypt, they used to do it naked. I'm going like, it took you 30 seconds. <laughs> and then I realized, I'm using the wrong resources. And that's why I decided to look into all of this vast amount of information of ancient Near Eastern history, which I went back to college to get my master's on it because I realized how much I did not know about context. Now, what I'm, what I'm doing is studying first century Greco-Roman understanding, culture, language, geography, to place the letters of Paul to a real audience in a real context. And I, I got to tell you, man, it changes a lot of stuff. When you and you know what's really that. funny? You know what's really funny? In this last year, I actually taught this subject in a college here in Israel. You did? You know, I, I became a professor. I became a teacher's assistant. Cool. And I actually had to teach uh, um, students about the Greco-Roman world. I mean, I, I, I studied the, 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 Gre the Greek world in my, in my bachelor's. But now I have to teach other people. So you sit down, you read more and more and more. Yeah. And I had this really funny discussion with my uh, with my uh, uh, my boss, basically, uh, about this issue that um, when you need to teach students, you know, people who are either first year, second year, third year, doesn't really matter. The problem that you have is you have to transition their minds from thinking in one way. I'm not forcing it down their throat. This is this is how she works, and this is how I prefer to work as well. This is where we're a good match on this. Um, to basically transition the students' minds to thinking more critically. Now, critical thinking doesn't mean okay. Let's take a hammer and bash everything, as the midrash says about Avraham who bashed all the statues and so on. No, we're talking about um, the idea of letting students open their eyes to see more possibilities. So for example, when you ask, what was the world of, Jew, of, of the people who lived in the New Testament? It was Judaism. But when we say Judaism, we don't mean the Judaism of today. We right. mean the Judaism that was different, but you could see echoes of it, or you can, a Jew who would go back then would still identify some things. So here's a really interesting example. Tfilin, tzitzit. 
people people recognize this, especially the tefillin, as a rabbinic thing. Rabbis invented this and so on. But then they went to Qumran. What did they discover in Qumran? These itty bitty little phylacteries, you know, which have little parchments inside of them. Most of them not like rabbinic Judaism, but when you examine the way rabbinic Judaism describes them, and the, when you examine the the um, the findings from the from Bar Kokhva caves, mm -hmm. you realize these are physically identical. So right. I want to draw a picture in your mind for a second. Imagine a man who was called Yeshua, who came from Natsrat or Natseret. Uh, actually, today in Israel, they say Natsrat and Natseret to distinguish between, well, it was Natsrat and Natseret, now they changed it to Nofa Galil, because people felt weird, because when he said Natsrat, it was the Arab city, and Natseret is the Jewish city. But he was from Natsrat, and you have to imagine a man wearing a four-cornered garment with tzitzit and probably also wearing phylacteries or tefillin. That's an image you never see. I have never seen anyone even today in the Hebrew roots movement draw an idea of Yeshua wearing tefillin, or at least I haven't seen one yet. But when you think about what was a common practice at the time, that was something that we know as a fact that Pharisaic Jews did and uh, Essenes did it as well. Now you go and people say, "But well, well, you know, there's the criticism." He talks about, "Oh, woe to you, Pharisees! You you lengthen your phylacteries and you make the large, you make your tzitzit very large, and you pray in the streets so everyone can see you." He's, but the thing is that he's. It, it, you don't have to read that as an attack on the idea of wearing phylacteries. Right. It's an attack on something different, on the the boasting, on the on the look at us. We're so amazing. We're so glorious. But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't wear tzitzit, because that's something that everyone had to wear. And probably he wore tefillin, and he also surprisingly went to the synagogue, which there are no synagogues described in the Tanakh. And he also read from, as it says, as it was his custom. Oh, no, I, as, it, as they would say in Yiddish, even though I don't come from a Yiddish-speaking family. Um, but, you know, I give out. <laughs> yeah, so, so let me ask you a question. So he has see. customs. So let me say, so Yeshua kept customs like Paul talks about, and James says, so that you well, follow orderly and keep the customs, because they, they were Jewish. People. Yeah, and, and so, Paul, beyond that, Paul boasts that he is a student of Gamliel, Gamliel the Elder, one of the fathers of rabbinic Judaism. So if he's anti-rabbinic, let's call it, let's call it, why, does, uh, why is that important to him? Let's call it first temple Judaism, so people know the differences. Yeah, so, so basically, well, no, He's Rabban Gamliel is one of the found, was one of the most important rabbis at the time for Pharisaic Judaism in the Second Temple era. But he, he was is the, perceived as one of the fathers right. of one of the fathers of rabbinic Judaism. Yeah, he was um, actually he was the president of Sanhedrin Council for yes. the, which and, which uh, is which is by itself a big complexion. But we're not going to go into that. <laughs> but you know the thing is though the Bible, the New Testament, gives us a uh, evidence. That Peter was taken. Uh, the, the, uh, check this is going to be good to to actually um, look into as an overall topic. Now, um, how the believers in Yeshua were actually taken to see the council. We're talking about the 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 Sanhedrin council now. I don't know if there were the twenty three or the seventy one, but they were taken to see the council, and it was Gamliel who actually defended them. He says, "Hey, if this is from God." You know who can fight against God, but if this is not from God, then remember. So uh, but, you know but you have to ask the question: Why would why would Rabban Gamliel do this if not that he recognized that this is still Judaism? It, that's my point. That's exactly what I want to go to. That obviously, if they what people don't realize is the seriousness of being taken to the to the council, which is called the Sanhedrin Council. You're talking about a major case. They're not going to just take anybody there unless they have a false accusation or a, a true accusation. And they are examined. And now and Gamliel is defending them. That means that they're living their lives according to first century understanding of how to follow Torah. That's the one thing we are amiss. We're not getting that. Why well, got it? When I began to look into the Sanhedrin and Mishnah, the tractate Sanhedrin, I began to understand the structure of the Sanhedrin Council. When I read that in the book of Acts, I'm thinking, wait a minute. This is a serious thing. They actually, the case for the gospel, if you think about it in those terms, 
got a they got a hearing in the Sanhedrin Council and they couldn't find any fault with their lifestyle. They just didn't like to hear the word, you know, about Yeshua. But you know, he resurrected and they still didn't have any issues with them. Why? They're living as Jews. Exactly. Aban Gamliel reminds me a lot of what happened in the 1700s with the Vilna Gaon. Uh, Rabbi Eliyahu Landi was approached by uh, people who objected to the Hasidic movement. Mm -hmm. And the Hasidic movement, there were issues and so on. There's a whole history there. But he said to them, when, when he was approached by uh, Rabbi Chaim Na'e, and uh, the, 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 no, not Rabbi Chaim Na'e, sorry, Rabbi Chaim Na'e lived hundreds of years later. Right? The Velozhin, sorry, Rabbi Chaim Velozhin, and, and others, and he, they came to him with complaints. They do this, they do that. And he said, you haven't shown me anything which is a violation of Judaism. Find me a violation of Torah law, of halakha, and then we can discuss if we're going to uh, uh, um, outcast them from society. Now we're getting to the point that I wanted to get to. When you study the, the New Testament, uh, and Yeshua's having arguments with the Pharisees, He's not really having an argument against Torah law, like a lot of people assume. He's having an argument with, which is what, moral pure, um, ritual purity and moral purity. He's trying to convey the message of you are imposing things outside of Jerusalem upon the regular people that outside the city of Jerusalem, because of the higher level of Kedusha, of holiness, it'll be too difficult for them. And you cannot, it's like, for example, in some sect of Christianity, they live, their definition of holiness is a, such extreme that if you don't do exactly what they do, they, to them, you're not holy. To them, you're not going to go to heaven. To them, you're going to go to hell. It's the same type of mindset. And then we come across, Ooh, we, we come that's, around. That's, and we, That's very important. That is very yeah. important. When people criticize Judaism, you know, as the saying goes, that actually appears in the New Testament as well, to remove the something between your eyes, a speck between your a speck in your eye or something. That's yeah. actually that's actually a Hebrew uh, saying, which was probably also had an Aramaic version of it. People point to Judaism, but remember, when you point one finger at someone, you're pointing at least three fingers back at you. True. And, and that's a problem, I think. The overall problem that we've had in the system of Christianity when we belong in there, that I belong and the people in the audience belong there, is a lack of context. When we go away from Christianity, we have this mindset of, I, was, I felt like they lied to me, I was deceived, I didn't have all the information. Mind you, we got all the books, but we didn't study it because we always uh, want to understand the Midrash, their interpretation to what the text says. And then we come to the Torah, and then we run to the Midrash, to what the rabbis say about the text, but I decided to go to the context. I'm not saying that the interpretation of a spiritual application is not important. What I'm saying is that in order, Paul said it, first the physical and then the spiritual. And many of us put the spiritual before the physical, and that's when we get in trouble. And, you know, when I read the New Testament, and I understand now the Judaism of the first century, the groups within Judaism of the first century, the, difference, the differences and the approach with the temple being the center of focus and everyday life, all of a sudden now we have a complete different message that we've been told. Yeah, and 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 it's it's really astonishing to to, to hear what you just said there because um, you know putting the physical before the spiritual is something that we've been saying in Judaism for a very long time. We, we had it. We had us. We we have the same problem in Judaism today as well with capitalists who make everything spiritual and the Rambam Maimonides um, attacked this methodology multiple times in different places and letters that he wrote and a uh, guide to the, the perplexed. And it really is very interesting to see the fact that he's, he's not telling people don't be Jewish. But I, I do need to note something which I think sometimes people forget. He probably wrote letters to communities which were Jewish and communities which were not Jewish. And the communities which were Jewish, he said, keep on keeping Judaism. Actually, more than that, I think there's a, one in one of the letters, um, it might have been to the Corinthians or something, um, there's a place there where he tells people to conduct themselves in a manner that they govern one another and look out for one another. And he basically says to them, don't be weird. Now, I wondered about that one. I can't remember exactly where. It might have been Corinthians. It might have been Thessalonians. I don't remember. Maybe someone here remembers. But 
this statement, don't be, if I kind of summarize what he says, don't be weird, made me wonder, is it possible that he's writing to non-Jewish people, telling them, don't give them an excuse? Because if you're Jewish, you're weird, no matter what you do. Right. But if you're not Jewish, but you have come into this belief in Yeshua, try to be as normative as possible without violating your loyalty to the Messiah. And well, I think this is sometimes what leads to a lot of confusion regarding what Paul says. I agree. And, you know, I, you know what? I, I did a study on the First Corinthians to my Spanish group. We went chapter for chapter in uh, First Corinthians where I learned a lot. And I come to realize that Paul was not writing. They're different. There was a caste system in Rome. You know that. There was yeah. uh, this, uh, the slave. I, I, I actually have to admit that I know that because you told me that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, there was a caste system. There was uh, slaves, freedmen, uh, plebeians, and patricians, and senators, and the elite. Okay, so I thought that he was writing to the whole community, and Paul is not. When you break it down, Paul is not writing to the slaves and to the freedmen because they have no rights. And I was reading a book that I just ordered. I got it somewhere. I got to find it, and it was saying that thirty percent in the Roman Empire, thirty percent. 5 million out of some 5 million people, I'm sorry, there were only 5 million Roman citizens in the whole Roman Empire. Now think about that. Citizenship was the, the, the thing. But 30% of them, of all the population of Rome, were slaves. Now 30% of 70 million, that's a lot of people. Okay? So, yeah. so Paul is now talking uh to the slaves and the freedmen because they have no rights they can eat of they couldn't go to the coliseums they can go to certain banquets they can partake of things that paul as a citizen could do so when i once i understood the context of first corinthians and the structure of government and the the 12 tablets of the roman empire and the criminal law of rome the 12 tablets of the law right and yeah. uh that's that's in rome so when I began to study that, I'm going like, wait a minute. Paul is not talking to the slaves or the freedmen. He's talking to the plebeians and patricians. That means that within the community of believers, there were people of elite status abusing the lesser in, in social status. And he's bringing a very strong rebuke. So now, how many people within the which Hebrew... Is some, which is something the Torah preaches, that even if you have a slave, right. you start to treat them as a human being. Exactly. He's teaching Torah principles the whole time. And that's what I'm trying to convey to people. It's like, wait a minute. How can you use Paul as an excuse to say that he's teaching against the Torah unless you're not trained to understand a guy who was a Pharisee? According to the law, he was a Pharisee. Now, when I began to look into the life of Paul, I realized that in the Roman Empire, if you're a citizen, you had to speak Latin. Okay. And he spoke Greek. He spoke more than likely Aramaic and Hebrew, because the text says he spoke Hebrew. So we're talking about a guy who spoke four languages, highly equipped a student of Gamaliel, and he was traveling the way he, he did was not normal in the first century, and you know that. So we have a highly equipped guy trying to teach people how to conduct themselves at the level that they live at. So he is saying, hey, man, don't try to be more Jewish than the Jewish people. Isn't that exactly what's happening today? People come over. You've seen it. How many people come to Jerusalem and they come to you and they, they want to be more Jewish than you? And they just came into this yesterday. We had this conversation before. It's happened on occasion several times, more than I can admit to. Right. And it's very weird because here you are um, living it in Israel, know the Hebrew, because I know you know the Hebrew. You taught me Hebrew. I'm learning. And um, and I remember when I used to try to teach the Hebrew language. Remember, I used to try to just take some Hebrew words and try to teach. And it only took me like the first four or five lessons with you. And I remember you told me, we're well, reading through a the Tanakh. And then you say, well, wait, be, read or be, be, be careful how you read the, uh, the vowels. Because if you read it this way, it changes the whole context of the whole sentence. And I go like, wait a minute, if I say this the wrong way, it changes everything. Oh, yeah. So I stopped teaching Hebrew. I don't know enough. I don't know anything. So now you got people taking words and creating their own thing. And you hear it as a Jewish person. Then what do you think when you hear that? 
um, it, it's very disturbing. I mean, it's, it's someone comes from the outside and starts trying to tell me how my culture is supposed to work. I mean, it's besides being, you know, it's kind of funny because people perceive Jews as white. So it's easy to speak to white people and telling white people about their culture, but people can really forget that we're Mediterranean. We're, we're, we're more closely related to Italians and Greeks yeah. and Egyptians and so on. So I remember from, for a very, very long time, it was very offensive because when someone walks up to you and starts telling you that, that you don't know your own culture, when this person has been, been kind of studying our culture from the outside for a couple of years, it is offensive. Now, I don't take offense anymore because I've learned to understand where people are coming from. But yet you have to remember that we are the originators of this culture. We, we are the people of this culture. And the fact that you've discovered something, there's a certain lesson in humility. I, I don't walk in and tell people what the New Testament says. Right. You know, um, Joel, do you me know, a favor. Turn on your Turn on your video again, because now to turn on. Yeah, it, it dropped. It dropped for some reason. So yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of this, this, there's a weirdness when you meet people who try to tell you uh, who you are and what you are. It, it, so it's let not... me, so let me ask you. So we can learn from each other. I mean, you've learned a lot about me and how I am. You, you met, you know my family quite well. Um, we've, you, you've seen everyone I brought over uh, on my tours. You've been on the bus with us. You know what I teach. You know what I believe, and I've never been, um, and I've never compromised my belief system because we're friends. Uh, I've always told you exactly what I believe, and you've always been very respectful of that. And, and, uh, but when, 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 what, what do you, and I can't say all of Israel, all of the Jewish people, because I'm only asking you, but overall, what will be, what will be the perception for a Jewish person to look at us who are turning the Torah, trying to live Torah? to gain credibility in the eyes of people who live the culture, who speak the language, who can read it directly from the text, who live that lifestyle that we're learning. What would, what would, what would you could recommend for people who are coming to the Torah to do in order to gain, um, we still need to learn to gain respect uh, so we honor Messiah and all this. So what would you recommend? Simple, basic courtesy and logic. Just be a, a normal person. Remember that you're approaching something that, and, and I'm going to say this also for myself, you're approaching something that you may have some understanding of it. You may have a lot of understanding of it. You might be a super duper expert and even have a PhD in the field. Even people with PhDs, when they study a culture and they go to that culture, they, they still need to learn from the people of that culture what the, that culture is. Kind of reminds me of the, of the if you've ever seen the movie Stargate, so it's just a really cool scene <clears throat> when he's sitting, uh, it, was one of my, it was one of the movies that pushed me to kind of study ancient Near East and Egypt, Egyptology and so on. And there, the, the character of the, the researcher is sitting with the, with the woman there from the, this Egyptian culture, and he's trying to understand the, how to read their text and so on. And... And he says, Najit, and she says to him, no, Naturu. So, for example, one interesting thing is that even in Egypt, Egyptologists argue how to read Egyptian. And I actually have a, a, one of my, one of my, a friend of mine who's also a professor who's hopefully will be my instructor for my PhD. I, I asked him about this and he said, yeah, we're not always 100% sure exactly how to read this. It can, can change the meaning of things. So you always have to approach things with a certain level of humility. It doesn't mean don't stand your ground. It doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to throw away my brain completely and forget right. about it. No, you because you, not everyone, even within the, the, the culture here, not everyone knows things. You know, it, it depends who the person is, but you still have to treat, you have to, as he sure said, he, he, he boils down the Torah to two things. He says, I am the Lord your God and love thy neighbor as thyself. Just remember to respect people. You can disagree. You can have arguments until the, until the, the, the chicken crows or the rooster crows. That's a temple reference. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's most important. The most important thing is just to be humble and be nice to one another that's how i learned i was a stubborn stubborn person i remember it took, it i was, remember it took years of pounding the stake until i actually started listening and realizing hey i don't know everything and but even remember, though you, even remember. though you said to me yesterday you're so you said to me yesterday you're so smart that you become arrogant about it 
<laughs> I think we all can become if we don't watch it. That's why yep. I surround myself with people who know way more than me in martial arts and in the Hebrew language and my temple studies, because, you know, you got to remember that my father taught me something when I was a kid, right? I played on this terrible baseball team, my father, man, but I wanted to play in the one that had all the best players. I mean, there was one team that were loaded, man. These guys, they will win championships all the time. And I wanted to win. I played in the worst team. Literally, I played in the worst team. So my father, I was mad. I said, man, we lose all the time. And, and, and by the way, that team that used to win, there were a whole bunch of guys who made it to the big leagues long term. I mean, that was that good. Okay. So my father took me aside. And he goes, okay, son, I know you want to play on that team. He goes, but let's be honest. If you go on that team, are you going to play every day? And I said, well, no, because they got two other guys who play first base. Oh, okay. So you're going to play every day now here, right? He goes, well, yeah. He goes, would you rather be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? And I thought I was a kid, but I got it. He goes, stay here and learn, play. Forget about winning right now. Just learn about developing your skills. The problem that we have when we come to the Torah, the vast amount of information is so huge all this contrasting arguments and, and debates and everyone wants to be right, that we don't want to learn from others and surround ourselves with people who know more than us. And one thing that Judaism does, that is the truth. I may not agree with everything in Judaism, but I do agree with this, is that although there are different branches of observance, and you know this, and there are different arguments about all kinds of stuff, and you know this, no denomination or religion is perfect. We know that. But when it comes to the core issues of kashrut, kosher, and the Shabbat, and the feast, they're all together. They may not agree, but they put their differences aside, and they are all together. There is a level of unity in certain things that is on parallel. And that's something that I'm trying to learn. How do we come to the place that we put our own egos aside, and we understand that for the better of the unity of the community, we have to understand biblical submission. And that's something that I'm trying to continue to get and understand and learn. And that's why I always call you for advice. And I talk to my teacher, Joseph Good, and I talk to other people in certain areas who know more than me. But if I'm talking to myself in this little bitty pond, I'm thinking that I'm the only one who knows everything and I could become arrogant. So now in my biblical journey, I have to be the little fish in the big pond. I got to go on that side, because if not, I'm going to suffer from arrogance, self-righteousness, divisiveness, and then we're not going to be good for anybody. So that's one thing that I want to thank you for helping me, challenging me to learn. And there are times where you did it when I got mad at you. I'm going like, oh, George, you're driving me nuts. But then I will think about it. Why did he ask me that question? Oh, what was he trying to convey? I remember, by the way, last time I was in Jerusalem. And I want to thank you for this, by the way. You gave me that Friday night. We had that beautiful salmon, which, you know, Shabbat dinner, that place down there in Jerusalem. And you let me talk to you about my thesis. Remember about Aphesis, the one that deals with Jubilee? And I, I would love for everyone here to have been there because me and him, Joe and I, you and I, we were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, but it was so cool because you will hear me out. You will give me your rebuttal and I'll hear you out. And then I give you the, and then at the end, you say, you know, um, if this is true, it changes a lot of stuff. And then you, you did something that was unexpected. You send the word aphesis to your buddy who's a Greek scholar. And I got to tell you, man, when you did that, I went like, okay, good. He's putting it to the test. And I'm going to see if I am doing the right thing. And then you know where I'm coming from. And you actually came back and answer, I don't know how much time later, to say, hey, man, what you were saying about that word is correct. You helped me become a better teacher. By the way, I've been presenting that everywhere and people are getting a clearer understanding that the argument that Yeshua is having and the disciples are having it. And Paul is not about Torah. It's about the enmity of the law, which is death. So you gave me all that clarity that now I finally put it together that it will be my thesis for my doctorate. So I presented it to them and they go like, wow, you know, we never heard it this way before, but it was our conversation for a period of two days that allowed me to get my thoughts together, proper arguments, and you were asking challenging questions and, you know, it allowed me to don't get upset, just 
bring it out there. And I want to thank you for doing that because it made me better. And I'm a better person and a teacher today. So I want to publicly give you thanks for that. My honor and my pleasure. Yeah, man. So lastly, last thing. So in all of your, um, in all of your research in the college and also in the, um, the little that you read of the New Testament, what has been your biggest surprise that you encounter reading the New Testament? Wow. Uh, if I surmise it into one thing, I think the biggest surprise uh, for me was really that point when I realized that Yeshua really is being a rabbi in the fullest extent. I mean, he's accepting the position of being a teacher of a group of people and following the protocol of, said, of such a teacher. Mm -hmm. that, that was, I think, one. I mean, there were a lot of interesting things that came up, but that was that, like, that one thing when I realized he's not against rabbinic Judaism. He's not against, against the Pharisees. He actually perceives himself as one of them, and he's developing his place as such a teacher, but he's doing one thing. He's being a real student of the house of Hillel, and he says, anyone who wants to learn can learn. You know, so what, yeah. he, what he did is he went around, he collected this collection of people that have nothing to do with one another, including a tax collector, which was yeah. literally one of the worst things you could be at the time as a Jew. It's like, That's like, for sure. You are, you are the, besides the Romans, you are enemy number one. And right. he takes this tax collector, he takes all these people and he starts teaching them. Now, we mostly only get the spiritual teachings, but God knows what else he taught them. Yeah, and, I, and, and that was the realization, I think, the, the thing that really shook the foundations of my understandings of things, that he had nothing against Judaism. He, had, he actually was interested to be an integral part of it, but he wanted to shift the focus from, one th from, from the arguments into, let's focus on the thing, that re the thing that really makes us the people of God. And, and this is why I remember, I, I, I said this without really knowing, but I remember one time I said to a friend of mine, you know, the Torah really boils down to, I am the Lord your God and love thy neighbor as yourself. And I actually said it again to someone else several years later, and he said, you know, you sure said that. And I was like, well, it's a logical deduction of information from within the Tanakh, but good to know that. Right. And, and, and that's the thing. I think that I think that, that, that was a realization where I, I suddenly understood better what he was and what he was trying to do well i'm glad that you did and something that we discussed it we talked about it for years and you were honorable enough to say let me look at it and and uh, just like i did with some of the uh, rabbinical um, uh, writings that you recommended I, so we come to the same conclusion i finally understand it a little bit better i understand their premise a little bit better and now i can make a better conscious decision one thing though that uh I, yeshua was never once against was the beit hamikdash the temple or the services or anything related to the holy things he never attacked any of that stuff he only addressed the corruption within the priestly family in regards to those things so that's the one thing that I keep screaming out of my lungs to people and they accuse me, oh, Rico all teaches about temple, 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 which is true, <laughs> but there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. And you being a Levite knows this more than anybody. And as a matter of fact, for the people who don't know, I met Joel at the, uh, in Jerusalem in the old city, they had this store that it was the third temple model. So when I saw it, man, I was like every day, the time that I was in Jerusalem, I will show up when he opened. I remember a few times I showed up before you opened and I was waiting for you. Oh, yeah, you were waiting there. Yeah. Where is, where is he? <laughs> yeah, he had a, a little wooden stool and I will sit there and I have this big old guy in front of me asking questions. I'm like this the whole time. And uh, oh, yeah, that's true. I'm actually I'm actually quite taller than you. It's true. Very tall. And, but you're, you're a pretty brawny guy. I mean, he, you have to imagine this. I mean, Rico is not a small person. He's, he's sitting on this little stool. And he's like, <laughs> I, I started feeling bad. I think eventually I found a chair for you or something. Yeah, it took like two years. Yeah, no. I would show up every year. I would show up every year and I would go like this. Hey, Joe, how you doing? And uh, no, I'm just, you got me a chair. It was really fun, man. I, I got to tell you, uh, one of the things that uh, I've learned a lot is reading the New Testament from Hebraic perspective 
And I've come, I've come to certain conclusions that when you met me, I would have never tolerated. And it's, there's been a huge transition of understanding that when you met me, I was very anti many things. And instead of me disregarding those things, because I did not want to associate myself with modern day Judaism, but you were not talking about modern day Judaism. We're talking about biblical first century Torah observancy. That's a completely different thing. And you came to the same conclusion as I did, that what we see today is not the same thing that was in the first century. And that's really the core issue that we're dealing with. And the, by the way, Joe Good, my teacher, you know Joe, right? Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't not had the pleasure of meeting him, but I know yeah. exactly who he is, yes. I remember I asked Joe, I said, Joe, but because, you know, when you look at him, you think he lives as an Orthodox, modern day Orthodox. So I saw him do something, nothing major. It's just something that I know that the Orthodox don't do on Shabbat. Okay. And I went to him. I said, Joe, let me ask you a question. I wasn't judging him. I said, let me ask you a question. What type of Judaism do you follow? He goes, oh, I only follow until the last Sanhedrin council. And I go like, wait a minute. So you don't follow modern day Judaism? He goes, no. And I go like, well, it would be nice because everybody thinks over there that you follow in modern day Judaism and they don't understand first century. If they do not understand first century Judaism or what we call Judaism, how will they understand modern? I think we have to go back to uh, the, uh, the origins of modern day Judaism, which you know, it happened after the destruction of the temple. Hillel was one of the forefathers of that. So many people don't know that, Joe. So the lack of understanding of context have led people to assume that what they see today was the same same thing as in the first century. And you know that's not true. Yes, I, I think that really that is part of the problem. But again, going back to, you know, both, you and I both have degrees in history, and it, we probably both felt kind of awkward when we first given an assignment to read an historical document. Yeah. And because there were because we didn't have the entire document in front of us, we would make crucial mistakes. I mean, this is a classic exercise you do. You give a student something, and then you have to try to make them see, see what they assume about the document. And then you tell them, okay, here's the background of the document, and then other pieces make a lot more sense. And that's really, again, going back to the, the classic problem I have as a, as a Hebrew teacher, as a Tanakh teacher, um, you know, I've been doing this for over a decade, uh, teaching people one-on-one, -on -one, is that I've had a lot of cases when students came to me and said, what is this verse saying? And I said, are you ready for a very, very long, painful description? Because I'm uh, a master of making short question, uh, uh, short answers become painfully long. Uh, I always make a joke of that to, to make a well, short you've story painfully me, long. Though. You've done that to me. I remember. Yeah, uh, but but so, but sometimes that yeah, but sometimes there's a need for a background, and you have to start yeah. explaining a lot of things. I remember there there's um I I wrote a I wrote a paper um that deals with this really short chapter in the Book of Kings. There's almost nothing in the chapter that helps us understand what happened there. It took me months until I was able to to compile everything and then write a paper and try to explain what happened within the story and you know what it was so compelling what i wrote and it was so interesting but it made me that it not only made me but also made my professor go like huh he's onto something here and and what was very interesting is that she, she actually she kept on saying okay every time you write a chapter send it to me i want to see what you found more right and it was actually rushed what was funny when i was done it was printed out read over and then hand taken to the head of the department so he can sign off on it because it was yeah. but it was this realization that i read this chapter and when i started reading the chapter i was in one place and then three four months later when i was done writing this because this is what you get like these two big projects when you're a bachelor's you get these two big projects to write a 25 page 25 i went to 35 i had to apologize to my professor for doing that but um because it was, was so much to say there that um, you know, my mind changed completely. I saw one thing in the beginning and I saw something completely different at the end of the process, realizing that, wait, so we can, I can be reading this chapter for the last 20 years and have the foggiest idea what's, what it's talking about. And right. then you actually sit down with the research and you realize, well, there's a whole background here and well, it's 20, what was it, like 21 verses or something like that. And it took me four months to fully understand this chapter. And you read it in Hebrew. So now imagine now an audience removed from the culture, from the language, from the temple, from the first century. 
and we come in with a disadvantage. We come with a lot of baggage, assumptions, biases, and now we read a verse like, and John and Peter went up to the temple, uh, the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And that's, it's taking me two days of something that I already know, just to put in the PowerPoint in an organized manner, because the service will take all morning. I mean, what, that, what the verse is describing in one verse, I'm only working on the morning service to explain to people everything that happened in the temple during the time of prayer that the Bible and Cornelius and Luke, uh, Zachariah was doing. And that's exactly what you're referring to. That when you start looking into the background of all this stuff, there's a huge amount of information and your mind changes because now you understand when you go through these prayers that they were doing in the temple at the hour of prayer, then you know that everyone knows the same thing because the text says they're praying outside as Zachariah was praying inside. So we need to understand what those prayers are and their significance of them. So there's a prophetic aspect of it. There is a, uh, I mean, ritual aspect of it. And there's a message behind it. Joel, man, thank you for so much for joining me. Thank you for spending this late evening in Israel and uh, afternoon here in Florida to share some of your thoughts. I want to thank you for everything you do. I want to thank all the audience for being here. And please remember, we're giving you a synopsis of what we uh, look at. I'm not saying that our way is the only way or that our perception is the only what you consider right. It's only our experiences on our studies. And uh, we keep learning, we keep researching, we can validate it. Validate, uh, verify, and educate ourselves to allow the evidence to establish any kind of truth. Thank you, Joe, for joining me, man. And by the way, is anyone here is interested in learning Hebrew? Are you still are you still teaching Hebrew? I'm still teaching, but I'm quite booked. <laughs> so. But either way, give them your email in case you have an open an open slot. You can get people because I'm sure you're not going to turn them down. No, I'm not going to turn. Well, the best thing to do right now is to join the the Bible group. I had the Bible group started as a very large group, and it kept on shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and now. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of reached a point where I need to add more people. So if you do want to take something that at least remotely connects to Hebrew, you can join the Bible class. If there's only, it's a very, it's also very cheap. You just go in and I don't charge a lot to, to join that group, but it's, uh, it's we based go over the text Hebrew. in Hebrew. And it's all, and it's so all based on Hebrew language, right? It's, it's all Hebrew. It's all culture. It's all history. Uh, I utilize all the tools that I've learned in the last 20 odd years of studying okay. uh, to try to explain different texts. We're, we're at the, towards the end of the book of Joshua now. I did the entire Torah that took eight, just, um, just about seven years to do the entire Torah, seven and a half years, okay. just yeah. to go over every single chapter, every single verse. All For right. some people, it's too slow. For some people, it was too fast. It depends on the person. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that if I'm doing this, I have to dissect this all the way through. So gotcha. um, there were there are even chapters that I had to break down to two, three uh, discussions. But I, I literally covered the entire Torah from beginning to end in seven and a half years. So it's cool. very, wow. very exhaustive. But on the other hand, it's very accessible. And you also get the recordings. So how do you how share do you... them? But, so how do you get on the website? No, I just, uh, you, you sign up and I send you a link and you just enter the link on Sunday morning. It will be, it's like Sunday morning, late morning in the well, United how, States. How do you, they sign up? Well, just email me. We'll give them the Hebrew email. in Israel at gmail.com. There you go. Hebrew, Hebrew in Israel. Israel. One word, Hebrew in Israel at gmail.com. Just contact me and uh, I'll lead you through it. Okay, guys, please understand that I'm very zealous for my believers in Yeshua. Joe and I, we've been friends a long time. And one of the things that I respect about him is that not once in the 17 years that we've known each other, he's ever tried to say stuff to try to convince me to ever renounce Messiah. So please understand that the reason why I'm recommending him is because I feel that I could trust him with teaching you the Hebrew and he's only going to tell you what's there. We have this understanding and we respect one another in, re in that regards. So understand that, you know, there's a level of trust here between friends and brothers. So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. And Joel, thank you for joining me. And I look forward to see you guys on the next podcast. I don't know when we're going to be doing it, but we'll come up with another good topic. I'll let you pick the a next good A good recommendation is people, if you have topics you want us to talk about, send us messages about it. No controversial you know, stuff. 
no controversial stuff, but I, I, I was literally sit, sitting on the bus thinking, what can we talk about? And like, suddenly out of nowhere, just like, oh, moment is like, oh, we can talk about the New Testament and Judaism. Go. And I just happened <laughs> to call you on that. All right, buddy. We'll see you guys later. Thank you for joining me. And I look forward. Please go to wisdomintorah.com, wisdomintorah.com, and consider also my temple course in January, treasuresofthetemple.com. Shalom, shalom to all of you. Bye-bye.